know, say, take, take all your time. <laughs> especially, especially the, especially the physical aspects of that. Say something about, okay. um, you know, what, what, what a week like was in, in that profession compared to maybe what a week like is in Zango right now. It has to be completely different. Maybe you could address that. I can. You know, David, I appreciate you bringing me on the call for a few minutes and let me answer a few questions with uh, everyone that's around the country and literally around the world. I appreciate you. Uh, given me this opportunity to speak for a few minutes. And, you know, folks, I, I wasn't the kind of geek that had pins and pencils in my front pocket. I had the little round uh, thermometers, and I had the digital, the small digital <laughs> thermometers in my front pocket. And, David, you're exactly right. When I would crawl out of an attic, I would look down, and those little thermometers would read somewhere between 165 and 172. And, you know, you talked about being 20 and 30. Well, folks, I was pushing 50 when I left that profession. And, uh, I, you know, I, I worked with a lot of younger people and had a lot of younger bucks that uh, thought they could handle that heat that, you know, we had to pull out of the attics and get them down under the shade and cool them down. And, and you know, I, I just realized, and my wife did too, even way before I did, that, uh, my body and my, and, you know, think about that kind of heat. Your your brain cells. I didn't need drugs, David. I had the heat to. I had I had the heat to to bake my uh, brain cells, and you know it, it did. And so uh, my, my normal thing, you know, my day sort of looked like uh, I'd come home, crash out for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, get up, have dinner, watch a little TV. 10, 15, you know, I'd watch the first part of the news. I never made it to pass the weather uh, to the end of the news because I had to be down and, and asleep by then, or I, I just fell asleep by then. And usually in the mornings it started, particularly in the summer, anywhere about 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. You know, we always thought, <laughs> it was always a joke that if we started earlier, we could get off earlier before the real intense heat hit about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that was such a joke, you know, because we just worked longer. Uh, there was always work, and there was always things to repair. You know, we had accounts with apartments that were 700 to 1,300 apartments, and, you know, oh. we were out there day and night because people couldn't be in their apartments at 115 degrees, and so they sat outside and waited for us. And so my, my theme song became one by Joel Walsh, just an ordinary guy, you know. And I, I went to bed thinking that, and I woke up thinking that. And, it, and I, I remember, you know, home to work, work to home, home to work, you know, and it, it just got monotonous. And uh, even though I, you know, I, I made a mistake early on, and I'll just share this real quick. I asked my wife to go to work when my kids, my two boys, were, you know, just entering their teenage years, and and that was a huge mistake on my part. I, I, she had been at home, and I should have left her at home, uh, because the boys really needed that time with their mom, and of course they needed time with me, but I wasn't there, and so you know. You know, during the summer, it was 60, 70, 80 hours or more a week. Folks, I can remember leaving the house at 5 a.m. and not coming back till 1 or 2 the next day. And uh, that's that's just how it was, week after week, month after month, year after year. My gosh. Mitt, how, how does that differ to a week now? You know, just physically, how does that differ? <laughs> you, I can you know, you. I'm going to ask you some mental things a little bit later. The next question, but just kind of physically, how does that? How do you feel now compared to that? Well, <laughs> if it's not obvious, you know, <laughs> it is pretty obvious. Even though you know we're on the phone, I I can remember network marketers that would tell me this is the the funnest thing they ever did in the world, and I think you probably said that to me too, David. And I just I shook my I would sh because of my mental attitude. And where I was at mentally, and, you know, I thought, I'm maxed out on what I could make. I, I can't bring in any more per hour than what I was making. I was well, and, your high. Brains, and, your, and your brain cells were fried. I think that's <laughs> what you're doing, huh? You bet. They were. And, 
you know, nothing, you know, I really couldn't retain anything because of, you know, working like that and out in the heat. And I, I can remember about the middle of August, I would just almost be in tears, you know, because when was summer going to be over? And I knew the answer, but I just kept, you know, lying to myself. I think, David, that might be a good point. You know, people that are working and, and working a job and, and feel like it's monotonous, you know, we have to realize that we're sort of lying to ourselves about where we think we're going. And uh, I didn't know where I was going at all. I just knew I had a job and, and hopefully putting food on the table and keeping a roof over our head. But that was about it. And uh, so has life changed? Tremendously, tremendously. Even though we're on the phone a lot and talking with me at, with people, building relationships. I'll tell you what, David. I wasn't real good at that for a lot of years. I didn't understand the importance of that, and I think there's a lot of guys out there that might not yeah. understand that either. Yeah. Uh, women are great relationship builders, and that's why a lot of women are really good in this business. But men. We're a little less coachable, and that was one thing. I know David remembers me years before Zango, and he goes, man, you weren't coachable at all. <laughs> and I wasn't. You know, now I can look back and I go, I was, I was hard-headed, uncoachable. I wouldn't commit. I, I wasn't consistent in what I did. So no wonder I was frustrated for a lot of years. You know, I looked at different uh, businesses even before David came along in my life and I really didn't understand what it took and uh, you're such so a good example Tom of why um, we should keep dripping on people absolutely. you know and, I, and when I say dripping I don't mean pestering there's such a difference but we, why we should just keep doing little things uh, send them a card send them a, a different video send them a you know um, Invite them to this, invite them. To, if nothing else, just call and wish them happy birthday or something. But just kind of stay in touch because you just never know. You're a perfect example. You just never know when when that hour, or minute, or millisecond comes when somebody's going to say, "Dang, I'm just so fed up. I, uh, uh, you know, and all. I'm just so fed up with things." And all of a sudden, at that moment, the call comes in. And for the first time, you're willing to listen, you know, and and th you're just such a perfect example of why we need to stay in touch and keep dripping and so forth. Because if I wouldn't have done that with you, I wouldn't have a 200K on my hand. But the mere fact that I didn't give up on you meant that eventually, you know, because of your building efforts and so forth, that I end up with the 200K. So, perfect example. Absolutely. Hey, Tom, yes. Tom, I, I want you to... You mentioned the physical aspects. Tell me just a little bit about what's this done for you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, some of the things you've been able to do in your life that you just, I know, I know, I know what you had on your mind. I know the kind of spiritual person you had, you, you are, and the kind of things you and Carol had on your mind, but the things you maybe couldn't do in those spiritual ways and emotional ways and so forth. Say some things about that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll share in a couple different venues of that. And uh, one is, you know, my wife and I really love to travel, David. And uh, our traveling before consisted of, uh, you know, we hoped we knew somebody wherever we were going and that we hoped they had a good, uh, comfortable pull-out couch at least and a full pantry. Uh, because we might have enough money to get there and back, and that was about it, you know. And that's what vacations consisted of. And uh, Carol and I, you know, I, I added up uh, how many different countries we've been to in the last seven years, David, and it's, it, it's over 17 countries oh that we've been able to travel to and enjoy and, and, and enjoy, you know, traveling together. You know, my wife's had a dream board for years. She's had the magic refrigerator, folks, for years. And <laughs> no matter how long it is, keep those things up there. Keep them in front of you because, you know, I share, David, about a journal that I wrote in, and I've got it dated January 21st, 1994. I wrote the top ten things I wanted to achieve in life. Think about this. Seventeen years later. 17 years later, I realized 
or I came across that journal again about a year, little over a year ago and opened it up and realized, oh my gosh, we've achieved every one of those top 10 things I wanted to achieve. Well, now we've, of course, got some bigger th- bigger dreams, bigger goals, and so we got to do some more work, and that's okay. We're not afraid of work. We, we, we know what hard work is. We've been out in the member that heat. We've been out there. We've worked hard. But one of the other things, David, is, you know, when you don't feel like you have enough in your life, you feel like it's really tough to share with other people. And when Carol and I want to share, it's generally, you know, in giving to a, uh, a church function or uh, a mission. You know, you've even been on missions. I, uh, I have. Uh, yeah. Missions for your for your church and absolutely. And that was down to Africa a number of years ago. Almost gone about a month, and uh, had a wonderful time down there. But you know, I think about some of the other things. Uh, you know, training pastors in India, over 500 pastors in India. We had the opportunity to give money and, and be a part of that. Uh, there was an orphanage, and I don't know, I don't particularly want to call it an orphanage, but it was a, a haven for uh, young babies and young children uh, that were, I guess, orphaned in one way or another, maybe not by a death of a family, but maybe the family just couldn't take care of. Well, the problem with what was going on down there uh, south of Guadalajara in Mexico was there was a lot of wild animals, and they'd come and steal the little babies. And that was one problem. But the other problem is some of the parents that left these children there would come back and and take their uh, daughters and, and sell them into prostitution. Very sad situation. And so Carol and I were able to give and put a fence around that whole place, and it was a big place. And so we were able to fund that, you know, but those are the types of things we wanted to share in. You know, I, I wrote an article years ago, you know, what's, what's your passion beyond wealth? What do you want to do when you have extra income? You better know. And, uh, you know, we teach people to be specific and written and uh, put some time things to it so that they know they can accomplish it and get it done. Is that sort of cover what you just asked me, David? More than I thought. Tom, I appreciate <laughs> you for that. And uh, I, I knew about a lot of those things, but you even filled in the, uh, filled me in on a couple things I didn't know. And I just, I've always had such massive respect for you and Carol and who you are and what you represent and your faith. And I just appreciate that. Thank now, you. Tom, let's, uh, let's change directions a little bit. And you had to do some things right to get to this stage. You know, to be able to fund those type of things and those missions and be able to build and have the freedom. And, and I know it's not only those things you're a, you play, too. You know, you, you you like to go places. When you go play things, you're not just a sightseer. You love to ski and you love to golf, although you treat the and not, you treat it. I always say Tom treats an 18-hole course like it's a miniature golf course. The, the ball barely gets above the grass. But anyway. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm one of those worm burner people, David, remember? <laughs> the, wor- the worms are in trouble when Tom goes to me, but anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, that's not very nice, I apologize. <laughs> it's okay, that's, what, that's reality. <laughs> but Tom, what, is the th- what are some of the things you've done, uh, both in the past and, and do today, to build, that have, what, what have you done to kind of build your business to get to this stage, what what have you done? What do you do today? Hit me on prospecting a little bit and fill in well, some things that you that you do to build your business. Okay. Well, what I want to do is back up a little bit because, you know, I, I said earlier that I wasn't very coachable, and I, I know you'll agree with that, David. And, and you know, some of these things take take a little time and a little process. You know, particularly for me, I was I, I wasn't very coachable. I wasn't very committed or consistent early on and I realized at that point in my life here I was coming up on 50 years old I had to change some things and uh, it was tough It, it really was mentally tough to change but here's what helped folks finding a mentor who would prod me along at the right pace you know, I remember David coming to me and say, you know, he'd look at our back office and look at our enrollees and things like that, and he'd say, you know what, you're not quite where you need to be. If, you, if you're shooting for this goal, 